we are solving biology paper 5 today February March 2022 9700 variant 5-2 we have three questions in this variant starting with question number one some students wanted to investigate the effect of light intensity on the rate of photosynthesis in the Brazilian water weed Agaria densa. This plant is found in freshwater ponds. The students use the apparatus shown in Figure 1.1 in the investigation. A stand and clamp are used to hold the apparatus in a vertical position. Okay. So we see the apparatus. It is capillary tubing with meniscus. It is rubber tubing. We see the plant which is releasing oxygen due to photosynthesis. The greater the rate of photosynthesis, the greater the number of bubbles given off. And the water contains sodium hydrogen carbonate so that it can provide carbon dioxide. Okay. So students carried out these steps to set up the apparatus shown in figure 1.1. Some sodium hydrogen carbonate was added to a sample of pond water as a source of carbon dioxide. The syringe barrel was filled with the pond water containing sodium hydrogen carbonate. A fresh piece of E densa was cut under water. The cut stem was quickly placed in the pond pool, pond water, in the syringe barrel. Okay. The plunger was replaced as shown in figure 1.1 and adjusted until the meniscus in the capillary tubing was near the top of the scale. Okay, at around just at around 0 0.4, 0 0.4 centimeters. A bench lamp was used as a light source. The students noticed that bubbles of gas were given up from the E densa. As the gas collected in the syringe barrel, the meniscus moved down the capillary tubing. Why is that? Mainly because um, air was collecting up here, right? As a result, the water was pushed down. It was pushed down. As a result, the meniscus dropped below. Now, the students used their apparatus to investigate the effect of different light intensities on the rate of photosynthesis in E densa. Suggest a suitable control for this investigation. So, basically, what is the role of a control? Uh, mainly, the control proves a point. Proves the point that the reason we're carrying out this experiment is actually valid. That's the purpose of this control. For example, what is the purpose here? The light intensity actually affects the rate of photosynthesis. So you could think of it in one way. We could do the experiment in the dark. And we would see that the meniscus does not move at all. Because if there's no light, no light dependent reaction will take place, right? And no bubbles will be seen. That's one way of writing it. Or you could use um we could replace the live water plant with a dead water plant, right? Of same volume. Okay, or just pond water with sodium hydrogen carbonate we would have no water plant or we could have you know uh, sterile glass beads or any material of same volume okay so you have two options you can either choose to replace the live water plant or agaria densa with these are your options. You can either opt for a dead water plant of the same volume or sterile, inert, or glass beads or any material to be honest. Of same volume or it could just be pond water with sodium hydrogen carbonate 
basically no water plant. So uh, this is what the mark scheme is saying. This they also accept another route, the one I would have written, which makes more sense clearly. Oh, you could use boiled egg area as well, or you could just do the experiment. Do the experiment in the dark. That is a better control in my opinion. Basically, because uh, we want to see the effect of different light intensities on the rate of photosynthesis, that's why. Now, describe a method using the effort shown in figure 1.1 that the students could use to investigate the effect of light intensity on the rate of photosynthesis of Agaria Dancer. Your method should be set out in a logical order and be detailed enough to allow another person to follow it. So I'm going to teach you the basics for setting up an experiment in biology. So it's typically of seven marks, right? But there will be around 10 to 14 marking points. So mainly you're gonna look at the independent variable here, which is light intensity. And the dependent one is rate of photosynthesis. So how are we gonna change light intensity and how many experiments do we need to carry out? So we need a minimum of five, all right? So how to change light intensity mainly? We're using the same lamp, right? So we can use the lamp at different distances from the lamp, uh, from the plant, that's one way. Or we could use lamps with different power ratings or wattages at the same distance, okay? That works. Or you could say that you could vary the voltage or current of the lamp, that's fine as well. It's up to you guys. What you want to do but typically it's safe it's the safest to use uh, the lamp at different distances from the plant okay this is the safest bet or I'm giving you an alternate way use lamp With different power ratings or what it is at same distances okay moving on how many times do we need to do this so you could state like six times five times so they basically want to use a minimum of five different light intensities Okay, this is the same for all experiments. You need a minimum of five, okay, for the experiment to be valid. Now, uh, you need to say how you're gonna measure the independent and dependent variable. So let's start with the independent one first. So mainly you can find this in A2 physics as well. Mainly we use a light meter. Use a light meter. Or an application works as well. Uh, application to measure light intensity now so I, I get why they did not uh, prefer do the experiment in the, dark, in the dark as a control because it's a marking point here actually I get why they chose that right so that's fine, you could repeat this, it's okay. This is another point here. Carry out investigation in a darkened room. Or you could say with no other light source. All right. So, this actually acts like a control. Or the purpose of this is to actually see if, like, if there's no light, would meniscus, would the meniscus change levels at all? So, it actually helps us standardize the experiment. For example, if it did change by 0.1 centimeter, we'd know that it wasn't for the light intensity we're providing. It would have happened naturally, right? So, that's the purpose. 
it's done to mainly keep the background light constant, right? Because even if it's in a darkened room, there might be some light present, okay? So, uh, what about the... Uh, how are we going to measure the independent... I mean, the dependent variable, right? So, mainly by looking at the meniscus, right? So, uh, there are two ways in which you can do this. You can find the rate of movement or you could just find out how much the meniscus moves in a fixed time. I personally think this is better. Okay. So measure, note, or record the distance, the meniscus moves along the capillary tube or scale in a fixed time right so this is how we're measuring the you know dependent variable okay so how many marking points did we get one two three four five five down so now what else do you need to do we've talked about the basics now we're gonna standardize everything okay we're gonna standardize everything let's start so mainly we want to use the same length of water plant okay or you could use the, the plant which has you know same number of leaves so use the same length of water plant to keep things fair and we should use the same mass or concentration of sodium hydrogen carbonate right because we do know that carbon dioxide fx rate of photosynthesis so if it was limiting maybe if we put some more in the other experiment it would cause increased movement of the meniscus right so that wouldn't be fair um also the lamp could cause heating so we should release the heating effect because if we increase heat you know that there is some enzyme catalyzed reactions right for photosynthesis which would increase rate so yeah uh, we need to use a method to reduce heating effect of lamp so how is that we can use a beaker of water okay in front of the lamp right as a heat shield or there are some alternate routes you could opt for you could use uh, and use an LED bulb or a fluorescent bulb which does not release heat, right? Or release. Okay. So uh, we're done with eight marking points. What are the last three? So typically these two points are also common for almost all experiments remember this okay uh, mainly we need to make sure our data is reliable how to do that in case of physics as well we need to use at least three measurements right at each light intensity for each in deep independent variable basically each light intensity and calculate a mean okay these compared this is one marking point uh this is common for all experiments and, and the last common point is safety so typically it's uh you could just opt for it's a low risk experiment so that's fine so no precaution required or um if you want to say this this is very unlikely but you could go for allergy to water plant and what is the precaution uh, wear gloves or PPE right personal protective equipment so I'm missing one point though out of 11 from the mark scheme mainly we need to tell them that we have an idea of equilibration or acclimatization of water plant right so like you shouldn't start measuring the movement from time zero when you turn the light on you should just give it some time to adjust okay you should just give it some time to adjust so 
we should say some time should be allowed for acclimatization or equilibration right of water plant or the whole apparatus in general okay that's an important point that is all we get seven marks from here and one mark there we are done with eight marks moving on complete the sketch we have to create the results that you would expect from the method you have given in b1 all right so uh, the independent variable will always go on the x-axis so um since i opted for distance right so distance from light bulb you could also go for uh, this can be centimeters right or you could also opt for light intensity right with units of candela or even uh, lux any alternate unit works as well candela is cd candela so if we opt for distance from light bulb right so what's the vertical uh, x is going to be labeled as so we did not opt for rate okay we opted for distance so it's going to be distance meniscus moved in set time or it could have been like this time taken for meniscus to move a certain distance or even rate of photosynthesis or rate of movement of meniscus that works basically you just have to make sure it's consistent with what you've written okay so for me it's the distance moved in set time so obviously if the distance is shorter between the light and lamp the distance moved will be greater right also what will this unit be either centimeter or millimeter anything works okay it's your choice and if you opted for rate of photosynthesis it was gonna be centimeter per minute or something okay millimeters per minute your call so it's gonna be like this it can be a uh, linear right it may be linear or it may be curved it's up to you but basically the graph should be like this okay something like this and I guess you could make it touch this axis but a distance of zero shouldn't be there all right it can it's better to give it as a non-linear graph so what if you opted for rate of photosynthesis here and intensity maybe intensity right the graph would have been different as you increased in uh, intensity it would be a straight line passing through the origin or a curved line like this okay so make sure you draw a diagram according to what you've set i personally like this more now the students decide to use paper chromatography to separate the photosynthetic pigments found in e-denser leaves the e-denser leaves were ground up in a small volume of solvent to make a concentrated solution of pigments the different pigments in the solution were separated using paper chromatography the distance moved by the solvent was measured on the completed chromatogram the distance moved by the pigments were also measured the rf values were calculated for these pigments all right let's find out the rf value it's the distance traveled by the pigment 94 divided by the distance moved by the solvent front so 94 divided by 107 gives us a value of um 0 0.8785 uh, maybe they w they want the what do they want the value as did they tell us to fill up the table complete the table yeah to two sig fig so this is going to be 0 0.88 rounded off properly so the students used a published source to find the RF values. So we're going to compare these. So for carotene, right? For carotene. Oh, okay. Carotene is 0.95. Chlorophyll is 0 0.60. Chlorophyll A, I mean. And chlorophyll B, it's 0 0.50. The students correctly identified pigment 1 as carotene. Okay. Clearly. Since this is 0 0.95. Um pigment 3 as chlorophyll a and pigment 4 as chlorophyll b so pigment 3 as chlorophyll a 
because that's 0 0.60 and this at 0 0.50 um, chlorophyll A works but the last one it's a bit fishy right so the calculated RF values were not exactly the same as the RF values in the published source. Describe one difficulty with paper chromatography that could explain why the RF values calculated by the students were not exactly the same as the published data. All right. So mainly, what's the issue? Basically, you have multiple options firstly I think this is really important uh, we may have not used the same solvent right or maybe the ambient conditions were different the laboratory conditions were different or maybe there was a difference in the grade of chromatography paper right okay or each pigment may spread out during the movement to give a long streak or maybe it was difficult in achieving a concentrated spot of extract which led to this uh, you know different answer so let's just go for the basic ones maybe the type of solvent differed type of solvent or you could just say that we used a different solvent this is one way so or you could just go for improper preparation of solvent that works then we could just go for different laboratory or ambient conditions right that works and maybe the grade of chromatograph chromatography paper right the grade of chromatography paper was different it was not the same or maybe the chromatogram was not replicated you know the after we complete the process the paper that is left with the pigments it's called the chromatograph maybe chromatogram maybe it was not replicated okay maybe it may it might have been uncovered so the solvent evaporates okay that's another option like the chromatogram was not replicated like we could give an example that the um, might have been uncovered right so solvent evaporates and for you know the conditions we could go for the temperature or personal saturation of air with solvent so if the temperature is different right the different laboratory conditions obviously when you increase temperature kinetic energy increases so it would have been faster right so that's it 30 marks done moving on to the next one an invasive alien species see this I just want to tell you something uh, so for your February March paper paper 5 for your May June paper 5 whatever variant you're having as you can see there was a question on alien species in paper 4 right we had the hedgehog and this is repeating in paper 5 so paper 4 and 5 may have common topics okay an invasive alien species is a species that has been introduced into an ecosystem where it is not normally found and causes harm to this ecosystem invasive alien species can change habitats reduce biodiversity and cause the extinction of native species salt cedar trees tamarix SPP are invasive alien species introduced to North America from Europe and Asia in the early 1800s. A biologist carried out an investigation in a woodland ecosystem next to the Virgin River in Arizona, North America. In the woodland, there were areas that contained only salt cedar trees and areas that contained a mixture of native tree species and salt cedar trees. 
The biologist wanted to test the hypothesis that the diversity of rodents, mice and rats is lower in areas with only salt cedar trees than in areas with a mixture of native tree species and salt cedar trees. Okay. So identify the independent variable in this investigation. Something that we are not going to calculate. Okay, something that we are not going to calculate. Something that's going to be fixed in the first place, right? So clearly there are two areas, area A and area B. One with salt cedar trees only and the other with salt cedar trees plus native tree species. Do you get it? So this is the actual answer. It's the type of woodland. Or you could go for the presence or absence of native tree species. This also works. This is actually much better because this is present here. This isn't present here. So that's the difference. And we're trying to see the diversity of rodents there. That depends on this, right? So the biologists decide to trap rodents in an area with only salt cedar trees and to trap rodents in an area with a mixture of both. The biologist placed 25 small mammal traps. So look how the biologist is actually standardizing things, okay? at random sites, baited each trap with 10 gram, same grams of food, checked them after 24 hours, same time, okay? Identified any rodents caught, marked the rodents with an ear tag and replaced them back into the woodland. So we're doing it the same way, marking them the same way. And what is this method called, by the way? It's the mark release recapture technique, right? And they carried out this trapping process for four days in April. Okay, so we also fix this how many days in april it wasn't like we did it five days for one spot and four days for the other the number of different individuals of each rodent species trapped during the four trapping seasons sessions were recorded okay so what are we actually uh, fixing other than the small mammal trap and ear tag tag okay so these are off limits so basically the ones i marked 25 traps or you could go for same number of traps right what else in each area also 25 traps or the same number of traps in each trapping session okay right so in each area and in each session okay for each session what else i was telling you guys about the mass or 10 grams of food food for rodents right as a bait um what else the time interval actually i marked all of these the time interval 24 hours before checking trap right or the other ones are four or same number of days sessions for each area and the month was also fixed right standardized april season or you could just go for the time of year when the experiment was carried out. So many points, right? All of these were standardized. This kind of method that the biologist could use, it's kind of predictable. And honestly, this paper is much easier than others I faced. This kind of method that the biologist could have used to say the trap sites randomly. Okay, so this is basically, okay, so it's not um, the mark release recapture technique, my bad. Basically, how did the biologist, how did he or she uh, choose the sites? So, it can't be biased, all right? It has to be randomized. So, how to do this? We do this in uh, random something. So, we can use a random number generator. Or any app, right? Or any phone or tablet to generate 
numbers or coordinates or positions, right? And then use the numbers generated as coordinates or grid references to locate each trap site okay pretty cool next so we're gonna measure biodiversity so we should use simpson's index of diversity the value will measure from zero to one the closer it is to one the more the biodiversity okay so let's find it out we're doing it for the one with the mixture right so let's do this do they want our working you may use table 2.2 .2 for working oh okay oh they just want the value of d okay sure so four by nine that's uh, two three significant figures so that's 0 0.444 whole square that's 0 0.198 rounded off moving on one by nine that's 0 0.111 whole square that's 0 0.012 so it's the same for these Two by nine is zero point two 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 square zero point zero four nine. Let's add them up, okay? Point zero one two plus point zero one two plus point zero one two plus one one nine eight. We are getting a value of zero point two eight three. I reckon this is it. Point two eight three. Oh, sorry. This is the uh, the summation okay this is the summation of the value now uh, for the value of d we need to subtract this from 1 right so 1 minus your answer should give you a value of 0 0.717 0 0.7166 so it's 0 0.717 okay that's all um, they accepted a lot more though. They accepted 0 0.716 and 718. With reference to table 2.1 and the values for the, these two different years, state and explain the conclusions that can be made from the results of the investigation. So we have 0 0.717 in this uh, mixture area and 0 0.531. So I just taught you it ranges from 0 to 1 and the closer it is to 1, the better. So 0 0.531 is less than 0 0.717, right? So clearly this place has more species evenness or it has more biodiversity right so let's do this let's write the conclusions down and they want explanations right so the biodiversity or species diversity the biodiversity in the area with uh, mixture of native tree species and salt cedar trees is higher than the biodiversity of the area in the area of only salt cedar trees hmm now uh, so I'm gonna color code these so the second point is the conclusion that we can uh, arise at is check this out in general it doesn't have these two species right also the number is greater here it's nine compared to eight so we can also conclude that the area with a mixture of native tree species and salt cedar trees 
has more species or types okay then the area with only salt cedar trees okay so what are the explanations actually I'm going for explanation one Basically, think about it. if there are less trees available, there will be less food sources. Okay, clearly, fewer food sources in area with only salt cedar trees, right? And what else for the second one? Actually, the explanations are the same for both of them, right? What other points do we have? Mainly, maybe it may provide less protection from predation. So, salt cedar trees provide less protection or shelter. Okay, remember that. From nesting sites, etc. Now, we have the deer mouse, Paramiscus maniculatus from North America. The biologist extended the study to investigate the ab uh, abundance of the deer mouse. The biologist wanted to test a new hypothesis that the abundance of the deer mouse is higher in areas with only salt cedar trees than areas with a mixture of native tree species and salt cedar trees. Okay. The biologist used the trapping procedure described previously to calculate the abundance of the deer mouse in eight areas with only salt cedar trees and eight areas with a mixture of both. The biologist then calculated the mean abundance of the deer mouse in each type of woodland. Okay. So clearly the area with salt cedar only has a greater number. The mean abundance is greater. Uh, the standard error of the mean abundance of the DMOs in each type of woodland was 0 0.8. Plot error bars. Okay, so it's like this error bars. It's 0 0.8 AU, right? So this is at 4.9. So 4.9 plus 0 0.8 is 5.7. It goes up to 5.5, 5.6, 5.7 5 over here. And uh, 4.9 minus 0.8 is 4.1. It goes up to here. Okay. You could draw it longer though. That's fine. It's okay. Your call. Uh, what about this one? This is at 3.5 currently. So 3.5 plus 0.8 is 4.3. This goes up to 4.3. Right. And it will go down to uh, 2.7. This is three one two three two point seven. All right, this is it, guys. Fine. So now, what's the importance of this? If error bars ever overlap, they are not significantly different. Do you understand? Because clearly, see this. There's overlapping between these two, so they are not significantly different. Maybe it was due to chance. Do you get it? Explain with reference what these SE standard error bars, uh, standard error error bars indicate about the data. So, basically, what do they indicate? SE standard error bars show how close the calculated or sample mean is likely to be to the actual or true or real mean basically the mean we calculated as uh, 4.9 may not be the actual one because it varies right this is the average for multiple eight regions so Mainly, our mean may lie here, okay? It may lie within those two values, okay? That's what a standard error bar actually means. Now, what does, what conclusion can we is that there is overlap in the standard error bars of the two means. So, what does this indicate? This indicates that there is no statistically significant difference between the two means okay so how what do we do typically to compare two means typically we carry the t-test but this is an easier way to find this out okay 
I might cover a video on all statistical tests for P5 soon. Okay, so keep supporting. And this was a pretty easy paper, in my opinion. Okay, so we have the T test. Next question The values then analyze this data using a T test to compare the abundance state and null hypothesis. So, for always remember, for the null hypothesis, it's going to be we're going to uh, like uh, say that there is no difference between the abundance of the deer mouse in areas with only salt setter trees and in areas with a mixture of native tree species and salt setter trees Basically, the two types of woodland. You could just say that there is no difference between the abundance of deer mouse um, in the two types of woodland. That also works, okay? That's fine. Moving on to question number three mussels. Are mollusks that live in the seawater on the shorelands of coastal regions around the world? Mussels are a popular seafood and so are widely cultivated. They're quite salty. I tried them once in Singapore. After harvesting the mussels, the mussel farmer must replace them with young mussels. This is often done by collecting young mussels from wild marine ecosystems. Figure 3.1 shows mature mussels after harvesting. The slipper limpset, Crepidula fornicata, is an invasive alien species introduced into Europe from North America. Slipper limpets compete with the mussels and reduce the yield of mussels. Sometimes slipper uh, limpets are accidentally collected with young mussels. Mussel farmers want to prevent the introduction of slipper limpets when restocking their mussel farms. Okay. Scientists investigate the best way to kill sleeper limpets without harming the mussels. They put 30 sleeper limpets, length greater than 30 mm, into each of the four trays. Each tray of sleeper limpets was exposed to a different test condition for a period of three days at a temperature of 12 to 13 degrees Celsius. The test conditions are shown. Brine is concentrated in a cell. Repeat brine rinse, brine soak. Okay, leave. Organisms exposed to air. At the start of day one, rinse the organisms with a saturated salt brine solution for five minutes and then leave exposed to air. So, uh, repeat this for days one, two, and three. Okay. And brine soak is at the start of day one. Soak them for one hour and then leave exposed to the air. So, these two are rinsing. This is repeated rinsing and this is soaking them for one hour. So this procedure was repeated with, so it's kind of annoying how you have to read all this for four marks. It was repeated with one tray of 30 sleeper limpets, length less than 30 millimeter and one with greater than 30 millimeter. Okay. Fine. For each of the four test conditions. After three days, the scientists counted the number of dead sleeper limpets and dead muscles in each tray. The scientists repeated the whole investigation at a temperature of four to five degrees Celsius using fresh samples of sleeper limpets and muscles. The results of these tests are shown in figure 3.3a and 3.3b. A muscle farmer concluded from the results of the investigation shown in figure 3.3 that young mussels used to restock the mussel farm should be given a brine soak treatment to kill any sleeper limpets that are present. So we need to evaluate this conclusion, whether it is correct or wrong and how much we support this, okay? So let's check this, come on. So this is the one for uh, 12 to 13 degrees. This is the one for um, four to five. So they're choosing the brine soak treatment. Okay, so the light, the white colored one is muscle, and these are the sleeper limpets. So clearly, uh, even brine rinse, right? Brine's repeat, brine, re sorry, the brine rinse and the repeat brine rinse and brine soak, all of them actually kill, almost all of them kill all limpets. See this? Brine soak and rinse are better. But hear me out. Soak actually kills a lot of muscles too. Right? I personally believe that uh, repeat rinsing is better since less muscles die. What about 4 to 5 degrees Celsius? On the other hand, for 4 to 5 degrees Celsius, soak is better than uh, the repeat rinse because it kills all of them. Right? 
but yeah muscles still die here so there are good points for uh, soaking but there are bad points as well so let's see how we can um, answer this actually so uh, let's support the point first okay I'm supporting the farmer basically brine soak or treatment for kills 100% or all slipper limpets all the time right we get one mark for this um, brine soak or uh, treatment for and chilled conditions four to five degrees and chilled conditions or you could opt for four degrees to five degrees Celsius kills fewer muscles then at 12 to 13 degrees Celsius right see there's a decrease it was high 40 or 50 percent 50 percent ish now it's below 20 percent clearly okay so we can talk about the repeat brand brine treatment now right repeat brand rinse treatment so the repeat brine rinse treatment or treatment 3 at 12 to 13 degrees Celsius kills all slipper limpets and very few muscles so it could be the best we are going to criticize them as well right their conclusion or you could just go for I was talking about this at 12 to 13 or you could say that the tre the third treatment at 4 to 5 degrees Celsius uh, kills nearly all sleeper limpets and no muscles die so it could also be the best and now you can give some uh, data goats to support these points like um, we can support this point right so at you know 12 degrees to 10 degrees Celsius and 4 degrees Celsius to 5 degrees Celsius so what's the percentage that died it's um, 50 40 uh, 42 44 46 48 47 percent uh, muscles died what about here at 45 degrees Celsius it was at 10 12 14 16 17 percent 17 percent muscles died great and there are other marking points as well why uh, there could be some uncertainty in our data because there is no uh, no data on long-term effect no data on long-term on long-term impact right and then no results for small or less than 30 millimeter muscles think about it all these muscles are greater than 30 millimeter that's an issue what else we only tested 30 individuals okay not enough replicates and we did not test with a mixture of sleeper limpets and muscles okay and we did not test the conclusion the conclusion is has not been tested statistically right so we cannot come to a valid conclusion and what else yeah there was not a mixture that was tested and there is a cost implication for different treatments right so yeah that's all if you have other questions you can ask me um, I'm gonna link the paper for variant above and the specimen paper down below along with the playlist for paper four or five subscribe to the channel and I guess you're, you're done with your paper four exam right let me know how it went
and good luck for paper five. See ya.